Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Today's guest, Jay Glazer, is a TV personality and NFL insider who has broken some of the biggest stories in sports. You'll recognize him from the award-winning pregame show, Fox NFL Sunday, Fox's Thursday Night Football, and HBO's hit show, Ballers. Jay has trained thousands of professional athletes in mixed martial arts and is the founder of the Unbreakable Performance Center, a private training facility that's frequented by top athletes and Hollywood celebrities. He's also the co-founder of the charitable organization MVP, Merging Vets and Players, which assists combat veterans and former professional athletes who often face a tough road adjusting to civilian life. Now he's out with his first book, Unbreakable, How I Turned My Depression and Anxiety into Motivation, and You Can Too. In it, Jay opens up about his mental health struggles and encourages readers to share their vulnerabilities too. In our conversation today, we talk about outworking the competition, finding your team, and embracing your uniqueness. It's a powerful conversation. Here we go. This is my conversation with Jay Glazer. All right. So Jay Glazer, it is, uh, it's a treat to have you on, man. Thanks for uh, taking a minute. Appreciate it. So, you know, people see you on Fox, right? Breaking stories. They've seen you in Ballers on HBO, but People don't know the grind, right, that it takes to get to where you got to and where you are. Can you get me inside of that journey a little bit? Yeah, the overnight success was 11 years. <laughs> I mean, if I was get a, a full-time paycheck and, you know, I was making 9700 bucks a year. That's it. Living in New York City for over a decade. So there's a lot of rejection there. But when I walked in that giant locker room that first day, I'm like, man, how could I be different? Like, I knew I couldn't beat them at their own game. I didn't have the same education as everybody else. I had no experience, so how could I be different? So one, I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to be a relationship dude, All right? And, you know, that means I'm, I'm not just going to burn someone for a scoop. Um, but back then also, that kind of was taboo to have relationships as a reporter with players and coaches. And but for me, you know, you know, see in the book over here, I talk a lot about me needing teams to get me through the gray. So even though we were... I was, you know, we're, let's say, opposing ends or opposite ends. They're part of my team. So I built relationships. But the other thing was, I said, I'll be the last dude standing in here every day. So if, man, the other reporters are working 9 to 4, 9 to 5, I'd be there at 7 a.m. and leave at 7 p.m. I'm not going to outwork them by a little. I'll work them by a lot. And then you got to be willing to get rejected over and over and over and over. And I was just relentless, relentless. For, it's the way I fight. It's the way I live life. That's why I do business. I just keep going, keep going, keep going until somebody goes, oh, my God, get them off me. All right, give them a job away, whatever it is. So, yeah, that's that grind. You have to be willing. And here's the thing, too. Because I wanted to put so much time in outworking everybody in in the media to get to where I was, it didn't allow me to have, like, a part-time job or another job to pay the bills. And so I wouldn't take money from anybody else. But I wouldn't get, like, you know, before all this, I was – bartending and bouncing and, you know, stuff like that. And, um, but I wouldn't do that when I started covering the Giants. So I, I, I don't really know how I paid my bills. I don't remember. <laughs> I paid, I'm sure I had a couple little odd things. I honestly don't know how. I, and, um, you know, again, living in New York City, it's not the, the best scenario, but that's really, hey, look, if you want to get to where you are, secret of success is outwork in the world. Find out who the best is and do more than that. Yeah, I love it. Where do you think that drive came from for you? My drive came from, an inability to love myself from the inside out, me not feeling worthy of, of anybody's love. And I felt like I had to do big, great things for people to see me and, and love me and give me kind of lo- the love that I was looking for. So, yeah, that and that's why 
Now, the title of the book is How I Turn My Depression and Anxiety into Motivation. And you can, too. It motivated me. You know, I, I, I use that depression and anxiety of mine and that feeling of self-worthlessness um, to go do all these big, great things on the outside so I could get love from the outside in while I try to learn how to love myself from the inside out. And even right now, I'm still on that journey. And, you know, doing this book is one of those things like, I've got to do these big, great outside things to, to almost um, show myself that I'm not as bad as I as the roommates in my head tell me I am. Whose approval do you think you're chasing? Probably the world's, uh, the universe's. The world, I don't know. Um, it's just, and look, this is something I had as a little kid on. Like, I, I don't have a memory without living in the gray. I don't know what it's like. And, man, the worst, the worst is, you know, those 15 minutes you got to lay your head on your pillow at night being stuck with someone you don't know how to like or love or feel, feel worthy of being liked or loved by anybody else. It's brutal. It's hard. It's a, it's a really hard thing. So me as a little kid, I'd sit down, I'd be taking a bed at night. I'd scream every night. I was kind of always punished. And honestly, I just started talking to God. Like, listen, I'm a big God guy, big faith guy. And, and when somebody doesn't believe, that's their prerogative. Like, I don't understand why people get pissed off if I choose faith. Um, but I knew I wasn't alone. And I, I didn't ask God along the way, can you get me this job? Can you get me money? Mm -hmm. I said, hey, listen, I'll do it. Like, I'll do this grind. Just when I fall down, all I want is pick me up, brush me off, and let's keep walking this walk together. Well, and there's no doubt that your approach earned the respect of athletes, of coaches. Obviously, when you think about relationships, you think about trust too, right? What were some of the ways that you built trust with the people that you were working to build relationships with? Like, how, what were some of the things that you did? So funny, I'm in mental health now, right? Doing all this. Right. Kind of like the therapist back then also. You now we would talk, and then here's the thing. There's a pack mentality in a lot of locker rooms. So what I would do if, let's say, you know, one of the giant players was talking, um, you know, Lawrence Taylor was talking, everybody be in LT's locker to do the same story. So then I would go and talk to the other 52 guys by myself, one by one, and just build relationships. So smart. Right. So go where everybody wasn't, maybe. Right. How can you do it? And I tell, I tell those people all the time, don't just be a face in the crowd. Like, be the damn crowd. Be different. Different is good. Different leads to success. You've scored some of the biggest scoops in NFL history, Jay. I mean, like, Spygate, right, where the Patriots were caught. Right, videotaping their opponent's signals. Oh, that whole thing's in the book. Yeah, it's. I it's, know it, the book's awesome. I mean, the book is awesome. When you're breaking stuff like that, right? When you're breaking stories like that, scoop like that, get me in. What's that like? It's a high. Is it the same, high, the same high? I get in a cage. Yeah. Okay. When, you know, my hand gets raised in a cage, or or a boxing match, or wrestling match, whatever. Man, it's the same type of high and. You know, when I, look, I was the first minute-by-minute minute breaking news guy in America. Len Pascarelli and I, when that, when this whole internet thing came out, which I, I think is going to catch That out. internet thing, right? Yeah. Um, in 99. So before us, there was no crawl in the bottom of the screen of breaking news and who's learned what. And, um, and back then, it was kind of me versus three guys at ESPN. It was John Clayton, Len Pascarelli, and Chris Mortensen. And then it became me versus five, and me versus eight, and me versus ten, like, Right, this is David versus Goliath. And then all of a sudden, my whole network popped up. And they had their insiders. And Schefter was over there at first. And, you know, it, it just became, it did become an addiction. It became a high. And at one point, I had to say, all right, this thing has taken years off my life. So I want to kind of morph from breaking every tiny little thing, man, to when I come on Fox and Apple Sunday, and I say something, you're going to know it. And you're going to go, oh, man, this guy... You no, know, I have the best information, most inside information. For example, three or week 18, as I was doing my coaching carousel, I said, hey, there's going to be one more coaching job probably going to open up here that you're not going to expect. It's just been a hard year on a couple of these coaches with COVID and last year or two. So don't be surprised to see one, you know, somebody step away, which I was talking about Sean Payton. Sure. And people kind of notice, who's he talking about? Like, you know, <laughs> I also want to say Brian Flores was going to get fired. I was hearing about that. So I want people to know, like, man, they tune in Fox and NFL Sunday. They're going to hear something they can't hear anywhere else. You know, your book is great, Jay. I mean, and I know that took a lot of courage, right, to put all that down on paper and get people inside of your head and your heart and, and, and all those things. 
and you talk right about mental health now a lot publicly. Can you kind of describe how depression, how anxiety, it's changed the way maybe you filter the world? I think it's a harder world to live in these days than ever before. Mm -hmm. Whether it's you know something like me with clinical depression, anxiety, or we just came through a pandemic where we were forced to isolate, socially distance, right? And that's the worst way, worst thing we could do is distance ourselves from each other socially. If you want to physically distance, okay, but socially distance was was, was not good. Um, and then also, like, we compare ourselves to everybody else's filtered fraction of a second <laughs> on this day. Mm -hmm. And it's crap. It's like, it's not real. So, of course, we think our lives suck. And, you know, at the same right, we're seeing so much hate online nonstop with Twitter. And there's just so much ne negativity. And the human condition isn't made for it. So I just spoke to a room of uh, 75 clinicians. And I said, look, we're all qualified to talk on this subject in here. You guys are qualified because of the schooling. Unfortunately, I'm qualified because of my suffering. And mine's an ongoing education. I need yours to be also. I realize that, man, meds may not work. Uh, certain meds may work differently now. Our brains work because of how much we're on the phone and connected to our phone and social media. And um, But navigating the grays is, it's a daily battle. Like, I never know who I'm going to wake up with every morning. There are things that I have to do to get the roommates in my head to play along nicely, talk nice to each other. Every single day. And the moment I get out, so getting out of bed for me is hard because depression makes you tired. And it's a physical thing for me too. It, it actually, um, I feel it behind my rib cage, on the left side of my gut and in my joints on, on bad days. And man, it's hard to get out of bed, but I have to. But once I make that decision to get out of bed, then I'm going to go after life relentlessly. Like that's it. Once I get out, okay, that's the only way to go with being relentless. Do you ever not get out of bed? Um, no, not really. When I do, like I had a, a pretty bad attack a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I called one of my training partners, come over and pull my ass out of bed. and <laughs> Said, let's go. Yeah, Mark Kerr, who's a former, he's the first ever UFC heavyweight champ of the world, 285 pounds. HBO did a documentary on him called The Smashing Machine. He's like the original of originals. I'm like, Mark, I'm, I'm having a bad day. What do you want me to do? I want you to come over and let's spar. I want you to punch me in the face. Like, give me some more CTE. I'll be good. Mm -hmm. That made me feel a lot. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, need, I need to get pulled off my couch that day. Has opening up and uh, it been helpful for you versus pretending that everything's okay, right? Especially with the book and, and, and publicly. Has that helped you? Everybody I've opened up to about it, it's got me closer together. Yeah. I want people out there to understand. Like, talk to your friends. Talk, talk to your family. It's going to make you so much closer together. It's, you know, vulnerability is real strength. Totally. Not my muscles here. Vulnerability is what makes me strong. You know, for a guy like you, and we're hearing more and more college coaches, NBA coaches, you know, talk about vulnerability, right? I mean, it, it, you know, 20 years ago, a dude that looked like you wasn't talking about vulnerability, <laughs> right? So it's awesome. You know, you talk about how anxiety sometimes hits you on set. What are some of the tools that you lean into to cope with in the moment? When you're in a real live moment, the lights are on, the camera's on. So I have a panic attack. I had a panic attack, anxiety attack. Every show from 2005 until this past year, every show I've ever done, and nobody's known. I haven't told anybody uh, until this book. Mm -hmm. And they asked me, like, yeah, like, why don't you tell us? It's, 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 I've got to wrestle with it. It's my abuser, not yours. And I told my guys, like, I don't want you guys to have to deal with it and bring down your show. Now, if I'm struggling during the day, I'll tell them. But when I have an anxiety attack, I've got to... Like I said, I wrestle with my abuser. You feel like you're having a heart attack. Your eyes start darting back and forth. You start sweating like crazy. Your heart's just racing. Your breathing is a little harder. My hands start shaking. So the first thing I try and do, and I have these pillars in this book about getting us through the gray. The first thing, if you watch me on Fox on Sunday, and I'm cracking a joke fast, it's usually to get me out of the anxiety attack. Mm -hmm. So laughter, like the gray hates laughter. So the faster I can get us to laugh and I can laugh, the faster I'll get myself out of it. And that's huge for me. And then I have to convince myself that, hey, I'm not dying, I'm not having a heart attack. It's not dangerous, All right? I'm safe. But at the same time, as I'm talking on TV to you, I'm literally talking to my abuser saying, hey, let me go, you're not gonna win this one. Hey, Jay, you're gonna be okay. Hey, Jay, we're gonna be okay. At literally at the same time, 
that I'm spitting words out about the NFL to everybody else. You know, I, I love how you talk about how you have turned your depression, your anxiety into motivation, which seems kind of counterintuitive at some level, right? That you've taken these two pretty heavy things and said, actually, it's really a motivation for me. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, that's the thing, again, because I, I don't know how to find that inside love. I had to go get all this outside love. And I think you, you see a lot of people who are really, really, you know, highly successful people who have a lot of things going on. They're chasing something from the outside. We need to, to show ourselves um, and convince those bad voices, the negative voices, we're trying to take away their voice, right? We're trying to take away their power. By doing these big, great things, we're trying to take away their power. So, you know, I've never been able to just, again, when I sit still, man, that's when the roommates in my head don't get along nicely with each other. So I'm always having to do something to, to kind of distract it. And like, again, I'm, so I'm great in chaos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm, I'm stepping in a cage with Chuck Liddell and Randy Couture and they're slamming me and kicking me in my face and kneeing me up. I'm good. Like I got no problems. Mm -hmm. That doesn't give you anxiety. Zero. That's feel, amazing. <laughs> I feel loved in there. It's crazy. <laughs> and maybe because I used to grow up, I felt like I belonged in a cage. Man, I'm great in chaos. 9-11 happened. I ran to it. Everything slows down for me. But I suck in calm. I really suck in calm. Is that, Jay, is that, you know, you've talked about ADD too, right? Is that, how does the ADD play into that? No, ADD allows me to, to do all these right. things. I, ADD, I just can't pay attention to anything I'm not interested in at all. Um, but ADD allows me to actually hear and see kind of everything, every conversation in the room. Again, I, I use, I don't use, like I'm proud of every scar I have, right? So I don't use any of these as a, like one thing I don't want to ever do is, oh man, I can't go to work and gotta take a mental health day. I got to, oh man, I got to get my ass out of bed and go do this. Right. And I you know for some people I, that, that works, um, and I'm not going to say anything bad about that. For me, I just, I'm not going to let any disabilities for me disable me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make them empower me. So anything I've gone through, anything, the name of the book's unbreakable because all this stuff did not break me. I've come through the other side of the tunnel. So I could look back and look at everybody else in the room and say, I'm not like the rest of you. Like I'm different. Right. I'm unbreakable. This couldn't break me. And I could say that to myself, but I guarantee you there's a lot of people in every room that I'm saying that that just need to be taught that and coach that also that have the same thing. They've gone through so many things that they've overcome and they haven't realized it. And they understand that's their superpower. It didn't break them. They're still here. In just a second, we'll get back to the conversation. But first, I want to share some exciting news. My new TED Talk is out now, and it's all about the secrets to a champion mindset. For more than 15 years as a sports agent, I had a front row seat to peak performance. What was the difference between those who maximize their potential and those who don't? You think it's talent, but it's really drive. And the real magic happens when the drive to achieve is replaced by something more sustainable, the drive to get better. The best know this, that the view from the summit is nice, but it's the climb that makes it all worthwhile. Check it out. Watch it now at mollyfletcher.com backslash TED Talk. And being different, would you say, I mean, that, that has been a bit of your superpower. Absolutely. You know, in, in our charity with MVP, I try and tell our own vets, man, just, they come home and they're like, oh, I'm different. I'm like, no, you're different. Yeah, be excited. Different is good. Different leads to success. Right? Let's do stuff nobody else has tried. Nobody else has done. Be different. Best ideas are ideas that nobody else has to come up with yet. Right, sure. <laughs> well, and, and speaking of that, right, I mean, you train athletes in your gym, right, in West Hollywood, in, in mixed martial arts. And we're talking thousands of pro athletes. I mean, you're not just, you know what I mean, dealing with a couple. How did this become a thing for you? So I fought back in the day. And I was at CBS, and I told the bosses there, hey, I want to do uh, mixed martial arts. And they're like, oh, martial arts, that's cute. So I didn't say <laughs> anything about a cage. Or, or back then, you could kind of headbutt. And, and uh, um, man, we kind of all went by different rules. And, you know, I didn't say, any, you know, kick in the face or anything like that. 
Um, so I had two fights while I was at CBS. And then my first day, the day before Fox, I won the largest submission fighting tournament in America or the world. Um, well, I won the world's in it. And when I came in my first day, Fox busted up. Like, I was shut. My foot was broke. My ribs were broken. David Hill, the chairman of Fox, is like, what happened to you? I'm like, I just won the World Submission Fighting Championships. He's like, I don't know what that is, but you will never do it again, ever. <laughs> but, man, for me, training is, is the greatest antidepressant. I can't stop. Plus, I need that team. Right? This is what I talk about in the book. You know, teams for me, like I talk about God being a team. My fight team are teams. You know, my MVP team's a team. My Fox and Evil Sunday team's a team. Um, my NFL team, I rely on all these people. There's teams. Um, so for me, I couldn't stop. So when Fox, and I kept trying to do it, and I kept, and I'm not a very good fighter. I'm not elusive. Um, I just go straight ahead, relentless. So I get banged up. I'm like a Pez dispenser, <laughs> right? I get hit a lot. So I can't really hide it. So man, the last, the last straw I came in one day, uh, I was missing this tooth. I had a gash down here and I broke this bone right here. And I had to come host the show like this. And uh, for Fox, I had everybody, Jay Glazer, Eddie George, Tim Brown, Jason Sheeler. And I, I walk in, the makeup artist is like, are you kidding me? I'm like, just use some makeup. She's like, you're missing a tooth. So I, I did the whole show like this. <laughs> Then the Fox execs brought me upstairs and said, hey, well, about your fight career? I go, really? Yep. You'll never be on our air ever again if you come in with a hangnail. Because your ears are cauliflower. My ears don't cauliflower. I've been doing this since 1982. It's genetics. I don't cut. I don't bleed. I don't swell a lot. Um, so you guys will be good. Jay, you come in with a hangnail. You're off the air forever. But it, it kind of, the sport institutionalizes you somewhat. Yeah. So God. I had to figure something else out. I pivoted and I learned how to start coaching guys. And first guy we ever coached was a long snapper from the Chiefs who, man, we took 25 pounds off his frame, really opened up his hips, got his hands whizzing. And he's a part-time D-end. And the guy went out and got 15 sacks, led the NFL. Eight sacks that year, got the highest contract in the history of the league. And that long snapper was Jared Allen. Wow. Wow. Yes. People don't realize that. He started as a long snapper. Dang. And all of a sudden, everybody called and said, whatever you did for him, do it for us. I'm like, what the hell I did for him? So myself and Randy Couture put together a program, brought in Chuck Liddell, the baddest of the bad, and taught these guys, if anybody, you know, football's still a fight, right? And, man, the way I want all our athletes and everybody to look at, like, even in business, like, I look at it like that business meeting starts at cage door locks. I'm going to beg to get out of that meeting room. Unbreakable Performance Center is what it's called, right? And it's like the hot spot for Hollywood stars. Obviously, you you know, elite athletes. I mean, this community is small, right? And you start moving the needle with guys like that, right? Everybody wants to be a little bit a part of that. They want that juice. And it, But it's more than a gym, right? It's way more than a gym. It's a team. It's a community. How's it evolved? You know, we are different a lot of things we do. So we're the only gym. And everybody trains together. So it's team training. And I always tell everybody, hey, Tom Brady worked out, 52 other people worked out pretty well for him, right? So, it's, again, and in our models, we build you from the inside out. You're going to have a team, and it's not a mixed martial arts gym. MMA component, I just want somebody has, everybody to have some fight in them. So we open up your hips to start. It's a four-part program. Then you do your, your, your performance, which is your lift. Then you do MMA, and then you do recovery, right? So it's a four-part system, and... But the biggest thing is, yeah, but building this community, I would say it's the only gym in America. I don't know this for a fact because I haven't been to every gym, but I would think it's one of a very few that has no mirrors. No, no mirror. Because I don't want anybody's back turned to the rest of the team looking at themselves. Mm, love or this team. All right. So now you know you got a team in here. Then you can walk this walk outside with the rest of us too, knowing you got a fight team behind you. And the other thing I did in there is I think I became the first gym in America to put a mental health therapist in there. So you can come train and go to therapist or you got something going on. A lot of times after you train, that's when your emotions are like, right, it releases these endorphins in your brain. And I know for me, that's when some of my best therapy sessions happen with my training partner. We open up, we cry to each other. So I put a, a therapist in the gym. So get me inside of the unbreakable mindset, right? Hit me with those, you know, sort of your five pillars that you talk about. So, 
A couple of them are, you know, look, it's your honor to, to fight her, a player. Nothing's ever going to be perfect. So, you know, there are guys like, man, Rondé Barber, who I use him as an example. I think when he retired, he had the longest active streak in the NFL of uh, consecutive games played. And he's a 180-pound corner, and he played with uh, torn rotator cuff, broken forearm, torn MCL, high ankle sprain, but a plate in his thought, like anything and everything you can imagine. It was like it was his honor to fight her. Like, that's number one. Number two, like, man, just be relentless. Again, relentless, 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 relentless. So the way Randy Couture, and I got it from Randy Couture, the way we fight is we don't stop. We don't stop. We don't stop. We don't stop. And you're going to get me early, but eventually you're going to go, oh, my God, I did not sign up for this. <laughs> you know, right? The other thing is I call it neutral face. When you're in there, it's the opposite of everything I want us to do in the world. Where I want us to be vulnerable and show it up. In there, neutral face. Like, my fighters cannot take a stool in between rounds. I want them pacing back and forth, pacing back and forth. So the other person's sitting there going, what the hell's wrong with Nick Laser? What's wrong with Randy Couture? Why are they not sitting down? We can't put our hands on our hips in the gym. Right? When you're tired, neutral face. I want them, eventually they're going to break because they, they're they thinking they haven't trained as hard as you. Now, a lot of times, and I wrestle with every one of our guys. I'm missing my L4, L5 because I ruptured it four times. L1, L2 twice, herniated C2, 3, 4, 5, broke my ankle twice, woke up during that surgery, broke, I mean, everything. And I'm hurting, but they will never, ever, ever know. And you can control your fatigue between the ears. I use this example in the book. Remember you're like a little kid, you're playing tag, and all of a sudden you're, you're exhausted, you're laying on the ground, your friend, your brother, your sister comes over and twangs you, and all of a sudden you jump up and run after him, right? You can control it. You forget you're tired. So we can control it right here. Most powerful weapon in the world is the six inches between our ears. Yeah, amen. So that's we that's really what we preach over there. And then the other one is find out who the best is and do more than that. If you want to be great, find out who the best is. I tell these players all the time, okay, you want to be great? Who's the best in your position? Let's find out what they do and let's do more than that. Not by a little, by a lot. That's how your dreams come true. I love it. Jay, I'd love you to share a little bit about your charity, right? Merging vets and players. What inspired you to to start it, and how does it work? So another pillar of my fight in the gray is to be of service. And so I've always had to start charities or do things to, to help others. And even when I was broke, the stuff in the book, like to this day, I go to the 99 cent store and I get toothbrush, tooth, toothpaste, handy wipe, deodorant, uh, socks, gloves, eight bucks. And I give them, make these little bags and I give them to homeless. Oh, I love it. Right? So for me, with MVP, like I know I can coach. So I decided, you know, I saw too many football players. I've been in the NFL since 93. I've seen too many of these guys go by the wayside. And, you know, the scary part is when they lose their community, their team. So I wanted to build a new community for them. And same with our vets. They do all these great things. Combat vets look up to pro athletes. Pro athletes look up to combat vets. When we put them together, they can save each other and just build out this new beautiful locker room. So we train for about a half hour just to give a burn. And then we send these mats. We have these mental health talks we're talking about right now so we can help each other through the transition and we all get each other. So we're in seven cities right now. We're about to open up the eighth in Phoenix. You know, several are on Zoom. It's beautiful. I love it. That's outstanding. It's awesome. You know, I think that there's so many people in the world, unfortunately, sometimes who are, are somewhat complacent, right? They're a little bit stuck and they maybe don't even know it, right? They maybe don't even know it, but they're sort of living on cruise control at some level. Your stock has been different in some regards, right? Rel relevant to depression and anxiety, feeling like, man, I don't want to get up. I don't want to move. I don't want to go. I don't want to do. What would you say to somebody maybe that's feeling a little bit stuck? You got to make a change. You got to shake yourself. You get like, that hasn't worked for you. Yeah. Right? So what's working, like, if it hasn't worked for you, change it. Don't be afraid to change. Most of us are afraid to change, even if it's going to be better for us. Right? So take that fear and throw it out the window and go, man, you know, the the pain of me not changing is way greater than the pain of me changing. And, you know, it's so I, I would tell somebody like, listen, if you're stuck, you're not working, keep going in, keep finding, talk to people, open up to them about it and say, I'm, I'm struggling. You guys got any ideas for me? Got any advice for me? I would ask for advice from everybody. And to this day, I'll learn from a beginner on anything. I don't care who it is. 
Hello to everybody. All right, we're going to end with rapid fire, Jay. So I'm going to hit you with a couple quick ones and you just tell me what comes up. You ready? Yep. Who's your favorite team growing up? Well, well actually, it was a season ticket all over the Giants growing up. Most memorable sporting event you've ever attended? There's something called Palio in <laughs> Italy. You know what that is? Seriously? No. Oh my God, it's the oldest horse race on the face of the earth. And it's like insane. There's 300,000 Italians all cramming this square. And it's on, it's bareback horse racing and half the jockeys get thrown off. And it's insane. Jeez. Yeah. Knowing you, dude, you, you, you jumped on one of those horses and got in there. I'll tell you what else is cool. Um, obviously every Super Bowl during the hundredth anniversary a couple of years ago. And then walking Randy Couture out for his last fight in front of 65,000 people at the, uh, Skydome in Toronto is cool because it's usually in front of like 17,000. I was like, oh my God, like when we walked out to the girl last week. <laughs> What's advice you'd give your younger self? Man, actually, I talk to my younger self all the time. Mm, what do you tell your younger self? I tell them, hey, you know, if I would tell you in the future, you would end up saving the lives of combat veterans. You'd be able to hold your head up high when you walk around the hallways of your school. Mm. If I told you you're going to be. The television Hall of Fame, one of the most famous sports show in the history of American television. Would you hold your head up higher? And if I told you you're going to do this, this, and this, could you hold your head up higher? You're going to wrestle a thousand NFL players, and little me keeps looking back at me saying, Do we really do that? Mm, that's cool. Part of my healing process is I'm trying to kind of go back to how I was as a little one and how little self-esteem I had back then and try to heal him through his journey. So the show's called Game Changers. So one last question, what game changer inspires you and why? Again, I'm, I'm trying to start building this new team with, with this book to get a bunch of people to walk this walk with me. Mm. So all these people I don't know, strangers, who I'm now helping be vulnerable enough to post on social media, wow, I'm struggling. Wow, you gave me the words to now have the conversation with my family. I had a grandmother tell me that. Wow. And all these years, wow. the first time wow. in her life, she now has the words to discuss her mental health issues with her family. That's a game changer. Yeah, I love it. Jay Glazer, this was fun. The book, it's awesome, unbreakable. People need to check it out. I loved it. Love it. Thank you so much, Molly. I appreciate it. Wow, what an awesome conversation. Here are my favorite takeaways. Here's some of my nuggets that I took from my conversation with Jay. Number one, outwork the world. How good is that? Jay's mantra is simple. Find out who the best is and do more than them. The thing is, most people know what it takes to be great, but they aren't willing to put the work in that it takes to be great. Outwork the world. Number two, vulnerability is real strength. That's so good. When you open up like Jay has about his mental health struggles, you know what? You inspire others who, who needs this too. So find your own team and, and, and trust them with your, you know, truths, your vulnerabilities. That's where real strength lies. Number three, stand out. Stand out. Ask yourself, how can I be different? Take all the things that make you different and instead of trying to hide them, Turn them in to your secret weapons. Hey, trust me, that one, I can't speak loudly enough. As a female sports agent, I was often the only woman behind the plate at batting practice, on the range at PGA Tour events. You can find your gifts in being different. Stand out. I love this one, Jay. Great stuff. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. This episode was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. Check it out. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.